The Tom Woods Show, episode 962. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're like me, you were a victim of educational malpractice when you were in school. Well, learn the history and economics they didn't teach you at mylibertyclassroom.com. And save yourself some smackers by checking out my coupon page, libertyclassroom.com slash coupons. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here with what I think will be a short episode, at least by my show's standards. I'm here at the Mises Institute for the Mises University week-long program in Austrian economics, and I've really been absorbing the whole thing, and I've been with my 14-year-old Regina through virtually all of the presentations, so I had thought I would sneak away and record some episodes, but I decided I'd rather absorb the program with her, so that's what I've been doing, and I thought maybe today I would say a little something about Austrian economics and go into a little bit of detail about some of the ideas that people may have heard but not really heard fleshed out all that well. Now, I've talked about Austrian economics on the show before, so of course you all know, uh, obviously I'm not talking about the economy of Austria, which is of no interest to anyone other than Austrians, but of course it's a school of thought that just happened to have Austrians as its uh, original members uh, dating back to 1871. So on the show notes page, which of course you know is tomwoods.com slash 962, I will link to episodes in which we've given the background and basic ideas of the Austrian school. So if you want to brush up on that, you can. But this is the school of thought that includes people like Ludwig von Mises, F.A. Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize, people like Israel Kirzner and Murray Rothbard. And it is, uh, of course, the school of thought to which Ron Paul subscribes. Now, the first couple of days of Mises University consists of plenary lectures delivered to the entire group. And then in the following days, you get to choose some of the presentations you go to. So you get the core teaching right off the bat in the first couple of days. So I was sitting with Regina taking notes on my computer during the presentations, but translating the presentations, in effect, into concepts that would be understandable to a 14-year-old who hasn't really read in this tradition but is curious. So I was basically trying to write, you know, teen-friendly notes on a lot of these things. And people were saying, give us the notes. We want to read these notes. I'm not sure they'd make sense because they, I was writing them after one of the lecturers would say something and then I'd write another sentence after somebody would say something. So she understood the context of all the notes, which she was reading as I wrote them. So I'm not sure they quite work. But anyway, writing these notes and then the demand for the notes got me thinking, why don't I talk about some of these basic concepts here on the show before I head off to the Institute again this morning. So the first of these things I'll talk about, and again, if you want more detail, then you can check out the episodes on these topics. But we start off with uh, praxeology, or at least that's in terms of talking about Austrian economics, you start there. This is the method of Austrian economics. It's a deductive method where we proceed not inductively as in the physical sciences where we gather data, form hypotheses, and run tests, but we proceed more in the manner of geometry where we engage in, in deduction. And we begin here with what is referred to as the action axiom or the axiom of action, which simply says that human beings act. And by that is meant that human beings use the scarce means of this world to achieve the various ends or goals that they have. Now, how you justify that statement has been debated among Austrians, but that the statement is justified, I think, is scarcely open to debate. So, assuming that we agree that human beings do indeed employ means in the pursuit of their ends, it turns out that you can actually derive additional information, very useful information, from this one observation about the world. And one thing that you can derive from it is that cost is involved in what we do. Because when I pursue an end, I cannot pursue another end simultaneously. So if I'm, my goal is to go to the kitchen and make a turkey sandwich, then I cannot at the same time play badminton. 
So I'm, I have to, so in other words, the process of action involves a matter of preferences and setting aside. So I pursue what I prefer and I set aside what I prefer less. So this is involved in every action simply because of the limitations of this world, the limitations of time, the limitations of my physical body, which can't be infinitely duplicated and be in many places at once, I cannot pursue all the ends I may want to pursue at the same time. So there is a preferring and setting aside process that's involved in action. Likewise, what's involved in action is the making manifest of what is in my mind about my preferences. In my mind, I prefer that sandwich over playing badminton. But you can't know that. You can't know what's in my mind. You can't experience my mind. And I could just be lying to you when I tell you what's in my mind. So what you can perceive are my actions themselves. And when I actually go about making the ham sandwich, that's how you can know that is, at this moment anyway, my highest valued end. And if I were, let's say, unable to make a ham sandwich, I would pursue my second highest valued end. So implicitly in my mind, I have a value scale, a scale of ends I want to pursue. And this is a ranking. There's nothing numerical about it. There are no cardinal numbers. There are only ordinal numbers, first, second, third, fourth. I don't use cardinal numbers. I don't say... I value making this ham sandwich 2.47773 times as much as I value playing badminton right now. I wouldn't say that. wouldn't make any sense. What would the unit of satisfaction be? How could I compare it across time? How could I interpersonally compare it? Maybe your value of enjoyment is different from mine or more intense. There's no way to do that. We, We couldn't say, well... I value this hamburger at 5.7 utils, and you could say, well, I value it at 10.1 utils. Well, what's a util, and how do I know that mine's the same as yours? So value, therefore, is subjective. And what I have is a ranking in my mind. And as I say, you can see me carrying through my preferences in action. Now, let's think about my value scale for a minute when it comes to a single good. Let's suppose we're talking about water, and I have various units of water. My most highly valued end that I would want to achieve with the water would very likely be drinking to sustain my life. Then maybe the second use I would have for the the second highest ranked end would be bathing so I don't stink. So there would be that. Then maybe the third might be, what else would I use water for? I don't know, maybe watering my plants. And then the fourth use would be washing my car. That would be how I would rank the uh, units of water. So drinking, bathing, watering plants, and washing my car. Now suppose I lose one of these units. Suppose I lose unit number two, let's say. Maybe I've got them numbered. I lose unit number two. Does that mean I go without bathing? Or, heaven forbid, go without drinking? No. What would I go without? I'd go without the least valued end. I wouldn't wash my car that time. I'm not going to go without drinking. Obviously, I would simply not pursue the least valued end. Well, then from here, we get the concept of marginal utility, which will be very, very useful in uh, economics. The marginal utility is the satisfaction that we're deprived of if we give up the lowest valued unit, in this case, the fourth unit of water and the washing of the car. That's the idea of marginal utility. And moreover, from here we can begin to develop the law of demand, which makes clear to us that if I'm going to continue to make purchases of a good, I'm only going to make purchases of more and more units of that good, either at the same or a lower price. Because as I acquire more units of the good, I'm going to apply that those units of the good to less and less valued ends. So therefore, I would be willing to part with less and less money to satisfy those less and less important, highly valued ends to me. And so here we have basically derived the downward sloping demand curve of economics. So in other words, we can draw an awful lot out of 
what seems to be this innocent, cutesy little statement about human beings act. A lot can be unpacked from that, is what I'm telling you in this short little overview. And the reason I'm doing this is that a lot of people have heard casually about praxeology or about the action axiom, and they've heard it claimed that we derive a lot of important economic insights from this, but I don't, I'm not sure they've ever actually seen that done. What exactly would that consist of? How would you derive concepts from it? Well, we derive the concepts of cost, value scales, marginal utility, and the law of demand from our reflection upon what it means to choose, what it means to to act, and we see these concepts are deeply embedded in that fundamental concept. Now, there's a lot more I could say about uh, fundamental concepts in Austrian economics. I could talk about how the the utility derived by the consumer is really the driving force in Austrian economic analysis. We don't begin with businessmen, which was implicitly where the classical economists had begun, placing the long-run price as uh, coming from costs of production. So the emphasis is on businessmen and their costs of production, and that's going to yield us the long-run price of a good. That sounds that's superficially plausible, but it's not true. The Austrian position begins with the individual and his preferences. And there is what we call a reverse or backward imputation that takes place all the way up the structure of production. The term structure of production is used in Austrian capital theory to describe the series of stages through which goods pass before they exist finally as consumer goods that you and I buy at the store. So a high order stage of production, in other words, a stage that's relatively far away from consumption, might be research and development, uh, product development, might be mining, um, expanding mining capacity, and then you continue down the, the structure of production to maybe intermediate stages where you have different parts of a good that are assembled on an assembly line and then you have the transportation of the good and you'd have all these different sorts of things until you finally get to the lowest stage which is placing the good on the retail shelf so that you and I can buy it and so that's I think a reasonably you know good good description of how consumer goods come about but the question would be where do the prices of these higher order stage goods come from? Like where does the salary of the research scientist come from? Or how do we know how to value the machine that produces tobacco or produces cigarettes, let's say? Where does that price come from? Because simply to say prices uh, of consumer goods are determined by costs of production just pushes the question back. Well, where did those costs of production come from? What, are they just magic? Would they just come from heaven? Where where'd the costs of production come from? So that doesn't really, so it doesn't really answer our question to say prices come from costs of production unless costs of production are just this mysterious given, which of course they can't be. They, they didn't come from heaven stamped with a number on them and a dollar sign. So where did the costs of production come from? So instead what we say is that the process does not go from costs of production then go down the structure of production and determine the consumer good price. It's rather the reverse, that our valuations as consumers, the fact that we want, let's say, cigarettes, maybe a bad example, but we want cigarettes, it's our desire for the cigarettes, our preference to have cigarettes, that then gives the machine that produces the cigarettes its value. If we all decided to quit smoking the next day, the value of that machine would go, drop to zero. Assuming it had no other use, it would drop to zero. And that would be because we don't value the finished good. So likewise, it's not right to say, well, the reason that uh, food is expensive at the beach is that businessmen have high real estate prices at the beach, and so that's going to lead to high prices for food. No, it's that the question would be, well, then where did the real estate prices come from? Why are they so high? Answer is because everybody knows that when people are at the beach, they're going to want that combination experience of being at the beach and eating. And so, therefore, entrepreneurs bid up through their mutual uh, bids to, to buy uh, real estate. They bid up the real estate price in the expectation that people will want the finished consumer good, namely food at the beach. So that's the way prices of goods are determined, uh, and particularly prices of, of, of producer goods, of capital goods, of the goods that make other goods. The consumer good 
our desire for that, in effect, the intensity of that is going to go up through the structure production and determine the prices of all the inputs that are necessary to create that consumer good. And then finally, I'll say, just in terms of some elementary concepts here, I'll say something about the socialist calculation problem, which we've also covered on the show. But very simply, here's how I explained it when I was talking about it with Regina. I actually started with the reverse. I started with what would economic calculation look like in a capitalist economy? And then I moved on to socialism. Now, in this case, I'll I'll define all these terms. In this case, we're talking about socialism in the classical sense that Mises would have known it when he wrote his famous article on this in 1920. Socialism was a system in which private ownership of the means of production was abolished, and there was some kind of collective or state ownership of the means of production. So that is to say uh, land, uh, capital goods, that is to say tools, machinery, the things that we use to make consumer goods, these are not privately owned. They're collectively owned uh, and and, uh, typically in practice owned by the state. Whereas under capitalism, the means of production are privately owned. Private businesses own all these things. All right, so I said to Regina, let's suppose you're building a building and you are totally indifferent between the four, these four possible inputs that you might use. Let's say you're going to build a building out of all one thing, like all lumber or all steel or whatever. So uh, we went through and I I think I had lumber, steel, plastic, and brick. Okay. I mean, obviously you're not going to build a plastic building, but it doesn't matter. And I put prices next to each one. I said, all right, for each unit of lumber, you know, it's $110. And for wood, it was $78. And I I assigned a price to each one. And I said, now you're indifferent between all these. They would all be equally serviceable. Which one would you choose? So she chose the cheapest one, which is the correct answer. Why not, right? We want to satisfy our ends with the the lowest valued means we can, because then we satisfy it the most effectively. So then I said, all right, suppose you were to make it out of two of these ingredients, Uh, two of these inputs, and again, so she chose the two least expensive. Again, correct. Then I said, all right, let's add up all your expenses for this business, and then let's say you earned in a month $5,000 in sales revenue from purchases in your business, and we will subtract your sales revenues. We'll take your sales revenues, subtract your costs, and if we have a positive number remaining, then you made a profit. And so we found out that in our little experiment, we made a profit that month. So then I went over to socialism, and under socialism, there are no prices for um, the means of production. I'll get into why that is in a minute. And I said, okay, now let's go back and look again at lumber, at uh, steel, at plastic, and brick. And this time, next to the dollar sign, there's just a question mark. You don't know the prices. So which one are you going to pick? She said, I don't know. Correct answer. Now um, you earned $5,000 in sales revenue because there are consumer goods prices in socialism. You earned $5,000 in sales revenue. Did you make a profit? She says, I don't know. Again, the correct answer. How can you calculate profit and loss if you don't know what your costs are? It's question mark, uh, you know, minus your revenues or something to see if you made a loss or whatever. There's, there's nothing to fill in for the question mark. So under socialism, and as I say, I'll get to a minute why there are no prices, but under socialism, as it was originally conceived, because, of course, today, almost no socialist favors having collective ownership of the means of production. They've seen that doesn't work. But you are groping in the dark. You can't know what would be the most cost-effective way and least wasteful way to do anything. Secondly, there are plenty of times when you could very easily use steel in your production process, but there are other goods that can only use steel. Steel's the only thing that's going to work for them. So they really need to be able to use the price system to bid those resources away from you so that you will say, well, I could use steel, but it's really expensive. So I'll just go ahead and use lumber. And that way, without even realizing it, you have released steel that is now available for production processes that can use steel only. And this is a way to make sure that each of the inputs is put to its most value-productive end. 
The price system guides these resources in a way that's rational. And, of course, these prices come ultimately from the desire of consumers for the finished consumer goods that these things can produce. And so this is a way that we know that we are producing what is most urgently demanded by the consumer in the most cost-effective, least wasteful way. But if we didn't have prices to guide us in these decisions, we would be making extremely destructive and wasteful decisions all the time. The economy would make no sense at all, uh, and you would have nothing but headaches and problems. Now, the reason you have no prices, of course, is that uh, prices emerge through the process of buying and selling through different private actors. And gradually, the market tends toward a market clearing price at which everyone who wants to buy at that price can buy, and everyone who wants to sell at that price can sell to a willing buyer, and so everyone walks away satisfied. Since we all want to satisfy our ends, we naturally tend to push the market toward this market-clearing price. But under socialism, all the means of production are owned by one entity, the state. So why would there be any buying or selling? If you already own everything, why would you sell yourself something you already have? You don't sell yourself the clothes in your dresser drawer. You already own them. So no prices can arise in that situation. And therefore, the planner is flying blind. Now, you can, in an extremely crude way, you can get prices on the international market. You can look at prices for major inputs and see if those roughly, you know, you can have those roughly approximate, you know, make those into prices in your own country. But, of course, that's going to be extremely crude and rough and and, uh, not especially helpful. So, but that at least helps socialism to struggle along for a while because if certainly if, if all prices disappeared in the means of production overnight, we would, you know, our capital stock would be destroyed because of all the crazy decisions we would be making completely in the dark. And so notice that the problem with socialism then, according to the Austrians, is not so much the why would everybody work hard if they all got the same income or why would anybody do especially distasteful jobs if they all got the same income or things like that, if there was extreme equality enforced? It's not even that, because even if you could somehow persuade people to work in that way, to work robotically without hope of reward, um, you'd still be still have this calculation problem. What would you tell these robots to do? And not only what, to, what uh, inputs to use, but what combinations of inputs of which there is... Uh, probably an infinite number, what methods, where to do it. Uh, Joe Salerno gave the example of somebody he knew in Montana who ended up buying a house that was built, I believe, in Indiana, and they drove this house to them 1,250 miles. Now, why would they do that? Why wouldn't you just have local builders build? Well, Joe was joking that, you know, there are about 12 people in Montana, and so labor is extremely scarce and therefore expensive, and needs to be put to its most value-productive use, which there is, you know, ranching. So instead, given how scarce labor is in Montana, it actually made economic sense to build the house so far away and have it shipped. Now, we know that because we have prices for the factors of production. But as Joe said, could you imagine a socialist planner thinking maybe it would make sense to build a house over a 1,000 miles away and ship it. It would never, ever occur to a socialist planner that that would be by far the least wasteful way to do it. And so because we have prices, we are able to make decisions of this nature, and that's what makes a free market economy go. So, all right, well, this is longer than I thought it would go, and I'm late, so <laughs> I'm going to get rolling. But um, I do want to tell you one thing before I go, I have a podcast to tell you about called Junior Moneymakers. This is like for kid entrepreneurs. It's to teach children the skills they need to pay their way through college, if that's the path they want to take, start their families, and live more or less debt-free. It teaches kids how to earn money by following their passions, so to speak, and also using skills they already have. It airs three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It teaches kids how they can start like a side hustle, so to speak, that gets them going with relatively little startup cost. 
They focus on entrepreneurial skills, and they interview real entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, who are actually engaged in business already. So very interesting and fun stuff over at JuniorMoneyMakers.com. And as always, you know, you can get a nice shout out like this when you're just getting started. But make sure before you get started, you check out the details at TomWoods.com slash publicity. That's it. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free. And we'll see you next time.